I'm going to give just a quick overview of what the program is going to consist of tonight. Uh, but before I do that, I want to stop for a second and thank uh, Stephanie and Patricia and, and Katie uh, and all the uh, people at Malaprops for hosting this, this reading. Um, Nan and I, <clears throat> excuse me, Nan and I are both sorry we can't be there uh, in person, which is what we originally planned but COVID uh, disrupted our plans. And so uh, here we are on screen. Uh, so now the overview. Uh, first Nan, uh, Nan Bauer Maglin, my, my co-editor uh, is going to give a short intro to the book. Next four of the contributors to the book will read excerpts from their essays. First up, Alice Freed will read from Dreams and Matches in an, un excuse me, in an Unsure Virtual World. Then Irv Peckham will read his On the Road. Both of those are from part two and from, I'm sorry, from part one and from part two. We have Jan Jacobson reading from her Checking a Different Box. And then Stacy Parkins Millet will read Date Mary repeat. Um, and finally, uh, as Patricia mentioned, there'll be a Q&A. Uh, now, uh, Nan will give us an overview. I'm sorry, an introduction to the, to the book. <laughs> Gray Love, stories about dating and new relationships after 60. 45 people contributed to this volume, 13 men and 32 women. Four pieces were authored by couples. The contributors are somewhat diverse in ethnicity slash race, sexual orientation, and regional representation. Contributors' ages range from 59 to 94. Gray Love is divided into two parts. Part one, to be or not to be in a relationship, colon, I have to do the, uh, punctuation. To be or not to be in a relationship, tales of humor, disappointment, rewards, and personal insight. And in part two, the complications and pleasures of elder relationships. The pieces in part one focus on the process of dating from start to finish. And by finish, I mean continuing to look for a relationship or deciding not to look at all. While the pieces in part two are about actually finding someone at the end of the process. The stories in part one dive into the subject of elder dating, the question and the process, the desire and the dilemma. They pose the question, do I want to find a relationship? The answers to the question, do I want to find a relationship are varied. Yes, no, and maybe. This section's stories tell of dating encounters on the internet and in person. Some see the dating process as a learning experience. For others, it is painful, disappointing, and exhausting. For still others, it's humorous. For some, it's an adventure or a gift. For yet others, a lesson about oneself. As Alice Freed wrote, and we're gonna hear from her in a minute, as Alice Freed wrote, her years of online dating added, quote, texture to her life. So part one is about the process of looking for a date, looking for a partner. The seven piece, the first seven pieces in part two Describe finding, quote, the one. Where you find someone has changed since those over 60 first dated. Meeting someone informally through family, church, temple, or neighborhood networks has been in decline since World War II. After all, most of us over 60 do not go to bars and clubs or, say, go rock climbing to find a possible partner. Instead, meeting online is displacing all other ways to meet someone. 
To repeat, the first seven pieces in part two describe finding the one. The 12 essays remaining in part two explore issues that most relationships encounter at any age, as well as some that are unique to elder relationships. These include having had previous partners and a complicate, complicated and deep personal history, family and friends' reactions to an older person dating, alternative models to marriage, such as living apart together, which is called LAT, having more than one partner at the same time, exposing one's aging body appearance and sexuality, and the pressure of time and the specter of illness and death. The stories here are about inventing a relationship at 60, 70, 80, and 90. This is not a how-to book or a book by one person simplifying and stereotyping issues older people face. Instead, it is an in-depth accounting of 45 people, people's complicated experience looking for connection, finding connection, and or coming to terms with one's singleness. Gray Love is about aging, about loneliness, as well as about independence and self-understanding. It is about the desire for intimacy and connection as you age. As Cynthia McVeigh, Cynthia McVeigh in the prelude say, said, it's about figuring out who, excuse me, it's about figuring out with whom and where to grow old. But the decision, unfortunately, is mostly not in your hands. So now we go to the writers. Alice, you're next. Need to unmute Alice. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Alice Freed. Sorry for that momentary glitch. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because my story is told by my story. Again, the title is Dreams and Matches in an Unsure Virtual World. This is not, as Nan just said, a self-help or how-to piece. I have a story to tell. In the fall of 2001, about a year after my then husband and I went our separate ways, when I was in my early 50s, I first tried online dating. At the time, this was far from conventional behavior for a woman like me. Instead, it was a daring foray into the unknown. For about a year, I carried on like a teenager with an embarrassing secret and finally abandoned the endeavor. Some years later, still living alone, but then past 60, I again turned to online dating, which by then was a bit more mainstream. Success, if that's the right word, continued to evade me. Despite this, I recognized that my collection of experiences had an unmistakable positive underbelly, which, or, which, as my mother would have said, added texture to my life. I am a fairly sophisticated woman, financially secure, reasonably well-traveled, well-bred with a PhD from an Ivy League university. I'm a feminist. I'm a published full professor. My titles of mother, sister, and daughter are my favorite titles. I'm in good health. Most of the time in fairly full possession of my faculties, I have extraordinary friends and a loving family. I am fortunate and certainly privileged. So you may know women like me, but in my story, I will do my utmost to protect the identity of everyone but myself. It all started after 9-11. Plane travel suddenly presented new challenges and risks and I realized that the magical, nearly perfect, but very long distance relationship that I was in was hard on my newly processed emotional self. I needed a clear and present companion, not someone trapped on the other side of the world. No one I talked to knew any straight, age appropriate, available men. Everyone good was taken or gay. And I quickly understood that it was going to be personal ads, online dating, or lonely nights alone. At the time, I was slightly humiliated to admit that I was doing this internet dating thing. 
but the online marketplace seemed to be the only way to go. By the time the pandemic hit, online dating was the only game in town, but this started before that. I have written more anonymous messages to more complete strangers than I even want to admit. I've learned to suffer the lack of response to my very cleverly written messages, and for better or for worse, I eventually learned to ignore messages that I received too from men who did not appeal to me. But because I was raised to always write a thank you note, it still feels rude to me. I've tried the right stuff and J-Date, eHarmony, Match, Tinder, Our Time, OkCupid, okay and a private matchmaking service. I've looked at the faces and read the descriptions, narratives, biographies, and profiles, different name on each site of thousands of men, sailors and doctors, PhDs, MBAs, CEOs, MDs, successful men, men who have been hurt in past relationships, men of 70 who love their five-year-old children from their third marriage, and men who love their grown children from their first marriages, men who were disabled, men who were sometimes in early stages of dementia, attorneys, engineers, judges, computer scientists, people starting second careers, widowers, writers, models, musicians, artists, who say there are no men out there. But even with a well-tuned sense of humor and a positive outlook, it is honestly an utterly exhausting endeavor. I had quite a few good dinners with quite a few good men. My dreamy prospects almost always acquired an affectionate term of reference that I used with my friends. There was the professor and the Marine and the pharmacist and the phantom, the glass blower, the Israeli, the yogi, the widower, and Jerry, Richard, and Bill. Messages arrived from all sorts of people. Several 25-year-olds contacted me and regretted that I found them too young. Everyone, including me, eventually sheds a few years from their published age because no one pays any attention to stated preferences anyway. Naive optimist that I am, I almost always got my hopes up before meeting someone new and the experiences almost always were depressing because they were so consistently disappointing. Only once did I have a scare and the story is worth telling. I met a man who I thought could be a winner. He contacted me via match. He was well-educated, an engineer. He had done two tours of duty in Vietnam. I was marching against the war when he was in Southeast Asia, and I decided to treat that as a historic detail. He had been a student of yoga for many years. He was semi-retired and had never married, which was normally a red flag for me. When he told me he watched pornographic movies in the afternoon, I assumed he was kidding. He said he was kidding. We made a date for a Saturday night, drinks, dinner, and a jazz club, and then we went for drinks, over drinks. There was a lot of touching on his part. I kept smiling. He told me horror stories from the war. I asked him to stop. He didn't stop. We moved to dinner. He was rude to the waiter, and I tried to ignore it. And then with no warning, he leaned over in this upscale restaurant, arugula on my plate, and gave me an open mouth kiss. The next thing I knew, I was in the bathroom calling a friend, asking her how I could escape. I had made the mistake, and this is why the story is important, of having a total stranger pick me up at my house in his car. My parents told me to never get in a car with strangers, and I should have listened to my parents. So from my early 50s to when I turned 70, I had more than 150 dates. That's 150 different men. Not counting repeats. I didn't keep an exact count, but this is not an exaggeration. Some met, I met at lectures, some were introduced to me, most I met online. Some I went out with only once, sometimes I tried several dates, some men I got closer to, and not one genuinely sparked my interest for more than a few months. Some vanished without explanation. Sometimes I was the one to disappoint. I met arrogant men and humble men. I met smart men who admitted to having no steady income. I met rich men who had no education. I met educated men who had no manners. I met mannered men who had no wit. Almost all of them were nice and decent people, and all of them were lonely. Hundreds of men in both New York and San Francisco, where rumor has it there are no straight men between the ages of 45 and 75. I have become a bit of an expert 
but I also see many years into this process that I'm happier than I realized at the end of each day with no one else's socks to trip over in my bedroom. And during the pandemic, I realized that maybe, at least for the time being, I'm finished with internet dating. I discovered that I had perhaps even lost interest in dating at all. But one thing is for sure, I know that I could change my mind again. There just might be wonders ahead, unexpected delights. So with continued curiosity about what new textures will be added to my life, and what new dating sites might be just around the corner and what surprises might be in my inbox. I still check my mail every day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alice. And now Irv is next. Am I on now? Yes. Am I muted? Go ahead. You're okay, ready. Got okay, got it. Uh, that was a great story, Alice. Uh, this is going to be perhaps a little bit of the flip side. I've been a writing teacher at the secondary and college level for 45 years. Um, and I, I did retire for uh, six years and actually I started teaching writing again. Absolutely love it. My wife of 41 years died of a particularly uh, virulent cancer nine years ago. It's uh, going on 12 now. She was diagnosed in January of 2011 and she was dead by August 11. I learned how to go forward by drawing on my love for Sarah. I wrote a book several years ago, years ago about going through her death and the dark period after that. It's a good book, but I can't read it. I wrote it as I write most things to externalize and understand what was going on inside me. When I write, it's like talking to Sarah, the closest friend I've ever had. Uh, certainly other widows, and <laughs> I appreciate Alice's story, other widowers and widows uh, share the experience of trying to find another partner. It's a major problem for those of us who've been left behind. I desperately wanted another partner. I'm sensual, I like sex, I like making love and holding a woman I love next to me. I like having breakfast with her, having her listen to my concern and telling me hers. I love loving someone. That kind of love seems to me like the bedrock of the human condition. Uh, learning how to go to the other side, which is where one lives alone, is quite a trick, which is really what my essay is about. I don't like to think about the time between Sarah dying and when I began to come to terms with myself. After Sarah died, I fantasized about having another partner like her. I knew that was stupid, that one should meet potential partners where they are not what, where one wants him to be. In fact, my first new relationship was a serious attempt to do exactly that. Lisa was a Tea Party fanatic, and I'm a quasi-Marxist communitarian in the old sense of, older sense of the word. I loved my relationship with Lisa, but it was never going to be the right one. For one thing, I wanted her more than she wanted me. She may also have held my age against me. I was in my mid-60s. I think she was in her mid-50s. In the beginning, we were both in love, but I think I wore her out after a few months. I thought she was beautiful, and she probably thought I was just okay. As I reflect on the relationship now, I think she just wanted a lover for a while, whereas I wanted somebody to love. Uh, she had also been married three times, me once, and there's quite a difference. In the next couple of years, I dated several women via match, one of whom I liked quite a bit. We had a strong relationship for several months, but I think ultimately ours was the reverse of my relationship with Lisa. I knew that Cheryl wasn't the woman I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. Uh, Cheryl in, uh, sensed my hesitation, and she called the relationship off. Although I've since moved from Baton Rouge, I have remained good Facebook friends with both Lisa and Cheryl, although Biden's wind over Trump uh, strained my relationship with Lisa quite a bit. But there is at least this. I have two more friends in my life. I know others have developed successful relationships with people they've met through online dating sites. I may have gone out with 20, of it, 20 women, <laughs> a little bit in contrast to Alice. 
20, 20 women via match, but Lisa and Cheryl were the only ones with whom a relationship was even halfway possible. I realized that my percentage doesn't speak well of me. I could write quite a bit about match, but I generally want to avoid those memories. Most of my attempts to find a partner online were just pure silly. We were like billiard balls bouncing off from each other, unwilling to let the other inside. Uh, people on Match seem to be jockeying for position, trying to find the most attractive and interesting person they think might find them worth their attention. Clearly, most of us overestimate myself, ourselves. Uh, Freddie and Slip there. I was surprised at many of the women who thought I would be interested in them, and I'm sure there were quite an equal number of women who were surprised that I thought that they would be interested in me. I was also irritated by the way I had wasted my time going through all the available women and sending notes to the wrong ones, the ones who clearly couldn't imagine hanging out with the likes of me. In addition, I dislike being suckered. The people who operate online dating sites don't care about making real matches. Their, ba their sites are basically con games. Their owners make millions from people's fantasies. Match generates about, although this is a few years old now, but uh, it generates about 500 million a year in revenue from lonely, lonely searchers. After a couple of years, I left Match. I decided I'd rather meet a possible partner in a real life situation, spy someone across the crowded room. But because I'm a person who enjoys solitude, this Hollywood style fantasy was highly unlikely. Even before COVID-19, I didn't like crowded rooms. Sometime later it happened. I saw her at a national conference for writing teachers. I was standing in line for, co with, for coffee when I saw this attractive woman, long hair, sweeping dress, intelligent face, looking at me, or so I thought. I assumed I was imagining things and ignored her, although I glanced at her now and then. By the time I got my coffee, she was gone. A year later, I was at another national conference of writing teachers. After the presentation, I made a couple of comments, my normal behavior and I saw the same woman looking at me from across the room. After the session, I went over to her and said, I think I know you. I did. A few years, a few years before, she had been a visiting professor in the writing program I directed at LSU. We met it again the next day, exchanged email address, uh, addresses, and soon a relationship was on. Um, I go in my article through um, uh, actually starting out with a relationship with uh, with uh, the person I called Mia. I ended up um, quitting my job at LSU and taking up a position at Drexel University in, old, old, uh, in order to be closer to her, actually. Uh, but it didn't work out. Uh, after about a year, uh, we, just, we went our separate ways. Breaking up with Mia was difficult. It was a replay of my earlier relationship with Lisa. I hated the way I lost control of myself when I fell in love, like hitting an icy spot while driving down the road and spinning into a ditch. After my experience with Mia, I decided it was better to learn how to live alone. I quit my university position at Drexel, listed my house for sale, and drove with Lola, my newly rescued dog, Pitbull Mix, from New Jersey to the virtual end of the road in Panama, where I had a place to cabana sit on 15 secluded acres for two months. Uh, the rest of the piece really uh, goes to what I learned about living, with, living by, well, actually driving down through Mexico and Central America with Lola, my dog, hanging out, uh, hanging out in this uh, secluded area for a couple of months and then two months drive back and what I learned about living alone. I will have to say that I took up this uh, project of driving down by myself, or I have to say with Lola, uh, in order to really get all right with myself, learning how to be intensely alone, particularly since I didn't know Spanish on my way down, although I, I, learned, it, I learned quite a bit while I was there and spoke a lot better when I came back. Right, so I moved to, uh, I quit my job in uh, at Drexel University and moved over to Harrisonburg, where I now live, to be uh, near my daughter. My daughter is a professor at James, at James Madison University, to be near her, here, near Heather and the uh, uh, three uh, lovely grandchildren I have. So I enjoy being in my house, waking slowly in the morning and talking to the dogs, exercising while listening to CNN or Eric Clapton 
taking a warm shower, shower, eating a slow breakfast, writing emails or writing to myself in my diary on the diary attic, playing my guitar, singing, I'm also a guitar addict, pickleballing, I'm a pickleball addict, mountain biking, I'm a mountain biking addict, walking my dogs, going over to my daughter's house for dinner, and watching movies with one or two of my three adorable granddaughters in my arms. Coming home, reading or writing with maybe a little weed and cognac on the side, going to bed, dreaming wild dreams, and waking up again. I asked myself, and I know the answer to this, who could, be not, who could not be happy like this, even alone? I have learned, and perhaps it's been my greatest lesson in life, how to be alone, seriously alone. My advice to people who have lost their partners in later life, get in your car with your dog, drive to Panama and back, while listening to Kerouac's scroll version of On the Road. Now, that's the end of my piece. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Irv. I don't know if I'm going to drive to Panama. Um, <laughs> it's quite a trip. <laughs> and next, Jan well, will share. I, I, do, I do want to mention, I'm sorry, at the end, I am finishing a book about that trip down and back. It'll come out in a, about two weeks. I'm doing final editing on it. Okay, next is Jan. And the next two pieces are from part two of the book. Jan? Unmute Jan, please. Taking a different box. I contemplated it for a year or so. And on this particular day, I did it. A simple click. Mail had been checked on my online dating profile for the 15 years since my divorce. I was 61 years old. And until that day, had only dated men looking for female. Had I been yearning to do this my whole life? The simple answer is no. As a teenager growing up in the South in the late 60s, I had crushes on boys like all the other girls I knew. I had boyfriends in high school and college. And at age 27, I married Ron, a man I loved. We were together 19 years and had three fine kids. He was and is a good man but we didn't communicate deeply and a reedy marsh grew between us. One night, soon after my divorce, I dreamt of my younger self on my wedding day. She danced with abandon in a coral wedding dress, her skirt billowing full of youthful hopes for what married life would bring. Suddenly she stopped, pulled its silky softness over her head and placed the dress inside a trunk. When she closed it, I felt her giving up hope of ever finding the kind of love she wanted. Nonetheless, a year later, I started dating men again. The men I met, though, didn't interest me. They certainly didn't justify the anguish of the divorce I put myself, Ron, and my children through. Why had I endured all of that if not to find a deeper love? After more than a decade of disappointing dates and a few short relationships later, I had no illusions left about finding the kind of man I'd been seeking. I thought about dating women, but the thought remained just that for almost a year. Why did it take me so long to act? I didn't believe as many do that there was anything wrong with same-sex relationships. I'd been a social activist supporting gay rights since college. So what held me back? I couldn't remember ever being attracted to other girls when I was growing up in Memphis in the 60s. Did this mean that I wouldn't be attracted to women now? I wanted the closeness, but could I touch another woman in that way? In what way was that, anyhow? Short inventory, what did I know? In college, the book Ruby for a Jungle, a lesbian coming of age novel had an impact on me, unarticulated but felt. When my ex and I had watched erotic movies, my body responded to the images of both the men and the women. Wasn't that true for everyone? I once saw a film in which a woman drops her robe and stands naked before a man who turns away. Damn him, I thought, aroused by her offering. I'd make love with you, but I couldn't actually imagine touching a woman's body. What would that feel like? Months later, I went out to dinner with two friends of mine from work, a lesbian couple. As Terry spoke to me, her eyes also communicated with Mary Ellen. I noticed how much was conveyed between them without words, how utterly connected they were. I thought, that's what I want. Finally, I checked that other box. Over the next few months, I had initial meetings with three women. 
but I couldn't sense in myself even a quiver of physical attraction. Was I learning that my body simply wasn't wired this way? Too early to know, I decided. One night I saw the profile of a woman named Suzanne who wrote about wanting a deep emotional connection. I had once written something similar when my box had mail, but had deleted it when a guy friend shook his head saying any man he knew would run from those words. Later, Suzanne confided that she had wondered why all I talked about in my profile was hiking and writing. Intrigued, I contacted Suzanne and we met in a town halfway between us. I was 62, Suzanne 66. She was intelligent, Jewish like me, vibrant and confident. For the first time this thought came, I could be interested in this woman. My body remained quiescent, but I was drawn to her. We continued to talk on Skype and share our stories. Suzanne had been married to a man, but she'd also been with other women. Over time, our connection grew. One evening, Suzanne told me, her image vivid on my screen, that her back would arch when she thought of me. And there it was. I felt it for the first time, that unmistakable current. Another evening on Skype, Suzanne asked me if I felt attraction for her in my body. I answered her later that night, I longed to touch you. I couldn't believe how natural it felt to write this or my boldness in telling her. I liked her, this earthy creature rising within me. Her daring was in striking contrast to my training as a Southern woman not to be forward. Where'd she been all these years? Suzanne and I kept talking over Skype and the current intensified. By the time I walked in her door for our second in-person meeting, we couldn't wait to touch, but I still didn't know if I'd feel that heightening of senses, that quickening of pulse, those surging rapids. Suzanne took my coat, set it aside, and walked me to her bedroom. Three hours later, lying next to each other in bed, Suzanne asked, are you sure you've never been with a woman? I hadn't been but I had the sense that this newfound woman inside me had been waiting for this since forever, or at least since she'd read Ruby Fruit Jungle all those years before. Yet later that night, I took a breath and said in the most unoriginal way, I can't do this. I think you're great, but I only want to be friends. I felt a panic. I couldn't explain to her or myself, just an overwhelming urge to stop what we had started. The next morning, she said, I'm offering you the whole package and you're walking away. I looked at her for a long moment, apologized, and left. Back home, my spirit sank. The buoyant energy that had whirled within me vanished. When Suzanne had said she was offering the whole package, it had felt for one moment like it really was all possible. Someone loving you and you loving them every day, nurturing each other, erotically connecting, grappling together with life, and being always willing to talk things through. And I had pushed it away. Weeks later, I found myself crying not once, but three times in a single day. I wrote Suzanne to ask for a second chance. It turned out she wanted this too. We set a date to meet again. This time, I wanted to be sure I didn't push Suzanne away. What had I been so afraid of? When I asked myself this question in a therapy session, an unexpected image came. That first night at Suzanne's, I'd looked at her soft, vulnerable eyes and thought, if I let myself love this woman and then decide to leave, I could really hurt her. And then a second image came. I saw Ron's face in the days after I told him I wanted a divorce. I felt like I was drowning in his pain. It hurt so bad to hurt him. But did that mean I should never love again? And who was I to decide what risk Suzanne was willing to take? We started to see each other regularly after that. When we were apart, waves of desire swept through me. These urges were so organic and powerful, I marveled at their presence in this body on the cusp of its seventh decade. One night, we watched a documentary about two women and their decades of love for each other. I was watching one moment and sobbing the next thoroughly unglued. I somehow knew it was grief, grief for the aloneness I'd inhabited before I met Suzanne. Another night, I took a risk and shared with Suzanne that dream of the young bride who packed away her hopes after the divorce. The telling brought to the surface the sadness of that younger self. 
Suzanne said, you seem different, softer, fuller, more present somehow. I felt like I was offering and she was seeing a part of me that had long been invisible to others, like a seedling under snow, shy to its new world, warmed by its first brushstrokes from the sun. On the day I checked that different box, I had no idea what that click of a mouse might bring. Now is our prepare our coffee each morning in the house we bought together in Asheville. I know. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And finally, Stacy. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm going to do a combination of reading and speaking. My basic chapter theme, which is date, marry, repeat, is about how I learned how to anchor myself in myself. And it was a long journey that I finally got in my 60s. So I talk about dating because it kind of eluded me as a kid, as much as it did elude me as I found myself after a 20-year marriage sort of back and available again. Um, I uh, was the one who initiated ending my marriage. And I remember at the time thinking that if I'm alone for the rest of my life, and not just thinking, but believing that if I'm alone for the rest of my life, it's going to be better for me because I had started to get to discover myself a bit. I picked up marathon running, which became really important. I know it's kind of crazy, but I found that that was sort of my anchor and way of survival. And so I'll take a, um, ex I'll share an excerpt here. Um, two years shy of my 20th wedding anniversary and 20 marathons later. I told my husband I was going to do one and my family, but I kept going. <laughs> anyway, I acknowledged to myself the toll a now empty marriage had taken on me, manifested in profound loneliness and diminished self-worth. I had lost my sense of self and yet was determined to fix everything by myself. Without talk therapy or talk shows or talk to your self-help books. Out of the blue over breakfast one morning, a good friend happened to share their own marriage hard time story. Uncharacteristically of me, I found myself asking for advice on how to get help. I started seeing a therapist who guided me toward understanding and validating my individuality and self-worth. A talk show, one resonated with me, something like, you can't live the life you've planned. You have to live the one that's waiting for you. I surrendered to purchasing a best-selling book for the relationship perplexed called Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. The book propelled me to finally act. My response to the 38 questions, simply yes or no, revealed which way to go. And I hired a divorce lawyer and so on and so on. And I became a single parent, repoised, poised to rediscover myself for the first time, actually rediscover, and I would say discover myself for the first time in my life and to really begin loving myself. And pre-marriage, I had dated a bit. I had been in monogamous relationships. I had the flings. I'm the 60s, 70s, grew up in Greenwich Village, free love, all of that. And I didn't really think too seriously about a partner at all at this stage of my life. Um, but then I did connect. And this is um, in my book, I connected with an old boyfriend. And that was a game changer for me and starting to realize that I was desirable, I was lovable, and maybe one day I would want to have a partner. So at age 62, I'm reading again now, I diagnosed myself as parentally relationship challenged. I wanted objective help with understanding me, myself, and I. And surfing the web, the web I found a, group, a woman called, uh, her name is Cheryl Spangler, heart and soul coach in Charlotte, North Carolina. Given that she did online sessions, specialized in people over 40, I was 50 something at the time, and offered a free intro section, session, I signed up. Coach Stangler became my relationship whisperer. I was really getting serious now about my potential to find the right partner. She guided me skillfully through self-discovery process that combined reading, writing, questionnaires, et cetera. After three months of weekly sessions, Coach Cheryl cleared me to enter the online dating marketplace. Since I had gained clarity about my must-haves, won't-haves, values, and deal-breakers, she insisted that I internalize the belief that my guy is out there and my job is to go find him. 
She detailed the launch tactics. One, don eye candy attire for a professional photo shoot. Two, develop a concise, concise written profile about my authentic personal passions and desired partner traits. And then three, blitz the pictures and text across on an online site specializing in partner bliss. I chose match. And I treated this quest like shopping online where you customize searches and peruse product details that meet your specifications. If only there were reviews. Instead, I created a journal to record my impressions of each date and to keep count of every encounter. And I found, now I'm going to speak just a little bit. Um, I met several people and I think a couple of people mentioned this. I think Alice did that there are gifts that we can get even if that person isn't that one. I met friends. There is somebody who I met not online who is a marathon runner who dated for seven years. And one of the gifts is that the house that I live in now in Asheville that that person found, but that relationship didn't last. So I have the house. Um, I had wanted to buy it. And I think of that as an amazing gift as many others, like jazz concerts in DC, a partner, a friend to go to the museum with. I just, I met, even though they weren't the ones through the dating process, I did meet a lot of people. But finally, there was the gift for all times. By now, I'm reading again. I was poised to recognize him as my likely partner to be. It happened in a New York restaurant on a blustery late January day. It was actually January 26th. That's not in the book. 2019. The agreed upon meet time was 5.30 p.m. I arrived early and he was already there. He was seated, sporting a zip-up gray wool sweater and smiling exactly like his online profile. We talked nonstop in teenage crush mode, me at 63, he at 66. The following Saturday, we met at a museum. I got home 13 hours later after we had dined out strolled all nine floors of Bloomingdale's in New York and enjoyed karaoke in Little Italy. That wasn't enough. We spent the next afternoon at another museum and an evening, a little bit looking at the Super Bowl. After 10 months, we remain on the clock, still loving each other. It was 10 months and 24 days of online dating and I found the right one. Date number 31, according to my journal. This life partner has enhanced my world with joy, passion, and friendship, fundamentals of teamwork and independence work for us. I love to cook. He does all the cleaning. <laughs> it's a great team. Um, we love to drink wine in the evenings. We watch TV series. We agree that calls from our now grown adult children take precedence and that's, that's priority. And we have acquired lessons from past relationships that strengthen our appreciation for what we have found in each other. We expect our con occasional contrasting um, views and we support pursuit of our respective individual creative interests. Our changing bodies have expanded options for sensuality. My journey took 50 years. The time be beauty of time has been unearthing the me, myself, and I that became too buried within me to grasp who and what I wanted. I learned to embrace the inner voice looking out for, the, for my well-being, asking myself always, are you sure he's going to unconditionally love, cherish, respect, and honor your kind, passionate, quirky self? So I do have parting words, a little advice. Know and treasure yourself the first season and in this season of life before venturing out in online dating and then courageously spread your wings and find out who's doing the same looking for you. Document your dreams and desires in a concise profile. I think I've heard people say, and I'm now just talking, that um, everybody puts older pictures, different. Uh, no, I put the real thing. What you see is what you get. <laughs> because eventually, if you meet somebody, they're going to find that out anyway. So I just use my real photos and re fairly recent ones. Um, limit exchanges electronically, there's nothing like face-to-face, -face, there's nothing like pers in person. Don't settle for not quite right, take a break if needed, never give up, repeat. And my little postscript is, we're going on our honeymoon next month, we got married last June. Thank you.
Well, that was a lovely ending. So nice. A round of applause for you all. Thank you so much. That that was lovely. And I would uh, like to just jump in, if that sounds good to you, Daniel and Nan, with some questions. Yes, go right ahead. Okay. So this is from Tina, and she'd like to know either uh, Nan or Dan, if you could answer this, please, or both of you. Um, I'd love to know how deeply you engage in developing the stories. Are you, are you largely collectors or do you play any co-creative roles? Yeah. Um, well, th this is like my ninth book of putting together books about certain issues. So I'm pretty practiced at it. Um, and it all depends upon the writers. Some people write beautiful, well-crafted essays. Other people don't say enough. So I have to encourage them to say more. I ask them questions. Uh, other people say too much and I have to cut down. And also since I'm and Dan are looking at the whole book, I have to see how they each essay works with each other. So it's a very long process. It's, it's, a, it's a fun prep practice process. And as you can see from these four presentations, wonderful stories, really interesting, touching stories. Agreed. Dan, do you have anything to add? Not really. Okay. Well, that's all right. That's okay. Next question. Uh, let's go to question for Stacy. Stacy, how do you weigh your times in a committed long-term relationship with experiencing serial relationships? Let me make sure I understand. How do I weigh my time? You mean, how did it sort of spread out over my 60 now, seven years? Or I'll, I'll defer to the presenter for whatever interpretation they bring to the answer, however you want to answer it. Well, I guess I, I actually, mm, I would say my life broke down into being in certain phases. I was in a committed monogamous, did everything for 20 years, totally long-term relationship. And then I had a break and I had a chance to set my sails a little bit and interact with, with men in ways I hadn't before. But in the back of my mind, I thought I'd like to have a partner, but I'd reached a point where, well, if I don't, I'll be okay. I, I don't do mountain biking or, but I run 60 marathons. I pick in watercolor classes. I love swing dancing. I, I, can, I do creative writing. I'm so thankful to Nan and Dan to have the opportunity to write this. So I have so many other things that fill my life. Um, but having a partner now, I'm, back I I set out and made it a job to find the person and that's what I wanted to do but if it hadn't worked out I would have been just fine I would have been okay I would have filled my life in other ways but I'm I realized that statistically I might be quite lucky but I worked at being lucky <laughs> great thank you so much uh Irvin we have a question for you you've clearly adapted to your loss of partner. If you could find the same partner today, would you want that? Second part of the question, or are you enjoying a second life? Uh, it, it, to, the, to the first one in a second, it wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be any question about it. Uh, being with Sarah is better than the life I have right now. But the life I have right now is really, really very good. I can't, I can't quite recall the second part of the question, but um, I, the, se it, the it second was, part of the question is: Or are you enjoying a second life? Uh, I'm very much enjoying the second life. It's a, a little bit like I'm sorry, I, I got to get uh, like Stacy said. There are just so many things to do. Uh, one of the things that I, you know. I, I probably shouldn't phrase it this way, but the way in which I've now learned to live, I'm a political activist, I'm a, uh, a daily columnist, or a month I write a column for the local newspaper, I teach one class, you know, I've just got a, 
a lot of things to do and my dogs demand a lot of time as well. You know, it's like at this point, there's hardly any room in my life for anybody else. You know, I just barely make room for me. <laughs> so in the remaining six minutes we have, if we could go around to all of you uh, contributors first, and I'll start with the order I see here on my gallery view. Jan, I'd like to start with you. If you could uh, please talk about what being a part of Gray Love has meant to you and what's next for you. Gonna need you to unmute. It's been a wonderful experience to be part of Gray Love. I'm very grateful to Nan and Dan for pulling uh, pulling this all together. Um, it's uh, yes, it's just been very rewarding to be a part of something larger than yourself and uh, read the other people's stories and uh, just uh, grow and enjoy in the process. So. <clears throat> Uh, and what's next for me is uh, more writing. Uh, I have other essays to submit. I have um, other longer writing projects uh, that I, uh, and I'm cutting back on work so I can write even more. So that's, that's me. Wonderful. Thank you. And then Alice, if you wouldn't mind unmuting, please, and tell us, what has uh, participating in the process of submitting and being published in Gray Love, what has that meant to you? And then what's next for you, please? So I wrote an earlier version of this for myself after about 10 years of online dating, because it was just, there, there really were some very funny stories, many of which I've had to eliminate. And then I, I received the call for proposals, if that's the right terminology. And I submitted the earlier version to Nan, and she said, if you could bring it up to date, I'd be really interested. And I had a lot of fun doing that because, as I said, I had written it for myself, and most of my writing has been academic. So this was, when I say academic, I mean really scholarly with a lot of research. So this was much more personal and a great pleasure. And then I've discovered all of these other wonderful stories, so I'm very grateful. I recently moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'm retired from full-time teaching, but I do some teaching here and I'm just finding my way in LA. And I've just recently applied to be a docent in training at the LA County Art Museum, Museum of Art actually. So just to really reinforce some of what's been said, I have so much to do. I don't know that I would actually be able to give the attention to a relationship that it a relationship requires. I, I can't do things halfway, but between teaching and moving and starting this dose training and learning to talk about art with young people, I'm breathless and it's pretty wonderful. So I feel very privileged, as I said. Thank you so much, Alice. And now I'll go to Irvin. Irvin, you teased us a little bit with this book that you mentioned. So uh, if you want to start with that, that's fine. And then also what it's been like for you to participate and uh, engage the other submissions in Gray Love. Well, I think most like, um, uh, like Alice and many others here, I've been an academic and I'm very used to publishing. I've done three books and uh, I don't know how many articles. So it's kind of just another article. Um, I've also done a lot of personal writing. I teach a lot of personal writing uh, with my students. So I engage in that myself when I do it. So or for me, I just have to say it was just another thing that I wrote. Uh, the, the, what I enjoyed about it was actually getting the book back and then reading about everybody else's experiences and getting the breadth of how we've attacked this, 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 this problem of being alone and what are we going to do with it. And I just want to say one thing. One of the things that I felt after reading the book, this is not a, or reading all of the articles, not a criticism, but there does seem to be a, oh, I've got to say it this way, a prejudice against people like me who really think that the goal in life is learning how to be by yourself as opposed to learning how to be, uh, be with another. I hate to say it that way, but you know, like I really go into that Zen kind of approach to life. 
Um, the uh, book that I, I I I did have quite a bit of a uh, the narrative in my in my piece about my experience about driving down to Panama and back. That was really a really uh, an incredibly central part of my life. Learning how to be in a car, just traveling through a country you don't know, through language where people don't speak languages, and finding out actually the book that I'm writing it's called Traveling Without Maps because I discovered as I was driving down through Mexico and Central America. They don't use maps down there and I didn't have any. So it was quite an experience. At any rate, uh, that book is really about, it's about the trip down, about the trip back, but it's really about learning how to be just exactly who I am and no more without anybody else other than my dogs. Other than the other thing I've got to say, you know, I've got my daughter living a few blocks down the street. I've got three granddaughters. I have my son in Colorado. I have a grandson in Colorado. I have a lot of friends. I've moved around the country uh, and I just have an immense amount of things to write. Uh, after I finished uh, publishing this book about my trip down to Panama and back, uh, I'm doing an educational memoir. I love to write about education. I love to write about the teaching of writing. So that's where I am. Thank you so much. And Stacy, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and answering yes. those two questions, whichever you want to tackle first, what it's been like to be a uh, participant in this collection, Gray Love, and then also what's next for you? Besides clearly planning, oh, you had a wedding, so I guess <laughs> you're new, you know, newlywed, la, uh, congratulations, yay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, basically, I was thrilled. I'm not an academic. I, um, I was a journalist in my early career. I covered Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, so short stories, writing, um, Writing was always a part of my life, but in a different way, uh, working in philanthropy, community development. And when I got the opportunity, when it's a writer, I thought, oh my gosh, this is great. Can I do it? Oh, and I pitched my chapter and I thought, oh, I don't know. I thought, oh, this is really fun. I, I get to like write what I want from a creative lens. And so it was just a wonderful experience. And then I also found walking down what my thinking was. And really, I have this chapter that explains a significant portion of my life. I think another part of it was seeing that even though we went on different trajectories, there are a lot of commonalities in the essays that I can pick up at different stages. And then Suzanne and Jan have been over to my house for dinner, and we've been over to their house, and we hang out. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have been the case. I mean, Jen, what's next for me is that I um, am, I did retire from full-time work. I'm doing creative writing. I've pitched a few. I write in multiple genres, um, creative fiction and nonfiction, children's picture books. Um, I have a website where I write an original flash fiction story every every month. And my audience is me, myself, and I, and my few subscribers. Hopefully they'll grow. But if not, I have a place to park my creative self in writing. My husband does ceramics. I help with him. He's starting to get exposure and we support each other tremendously. It's a, it's a great partnership as well as relationship in our mutual creative interests and pursuits. We're going to Portugal. Uh, this sounds so, lovely. It's been a pleasure to hear from all of the contributors. Nan and Dan, we're at a little bit past the top of the hour, but uh, any uh, brief final thoughts? Dan, you want to go? Oh, go ahead. Um, I just, since we have a little time, I just want to say this is a beautiful book. I love the cover and I love all the stories. And I'm sort of maybe going to go through postpartum depression because I hate giving the whole experience up. Um, but I do encourage everyone to buy the book or buy a, some book from Malaprops because they have been wonderful to us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Dan, anything from you? Um, <clears throat> sure. In, in response to, to that question quickly, uh, two things. Um, working with Nan um, has been a pleasure, uh, both personally and, and um, how shall I say it, uh, professionally, I guess. Um, and it has certainly contributed to, uh, to our relationship. Um, and also, I want to thank Nan for including me on this project. It was, it was her project to begin with. It's her brainchild. Um, and um, I appreciate having been 
brought along both, both personally and professionally because uh, this is my first university uh, press publication. Uh, so that's something all academics wa wanna have, wanna do. Um, and this gave me a chance to do that. Well, thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure to be a part of your event and to support the publication of Gray Love. I want to thank Nan and Dan, Jan, Alice, Irvin, and Stacy. Thank you for joining us and thank you audience for being here this evening. We hope you all have a great remainder of your evening and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.